Hello, folks. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you, uh, I suppose, the perspective from an assigned certifier. Um, I know we've heard from the local authority side of things. Um, and obviously, when we come to the table, we have to certify the works as the assigned certifier, either a chartered engineer, a registered architect, or a registered building surveyor. Um, so the book stops with us in terms of the responsibility of making sure it is compliant. Yes, there's 12 to 15% get inspected from the, the building control side of things, but we need to make sure it's right um, before we will present a CCC for validation. So um, we're the artist formerly known as I3BT, we're now called Catalyst, we've had a rebrand. Um, it's definitely easier to explain uh, in Spain and in Italy what a Catalyst is versus I3PT, I think. So, um, be car in context, I suppose over the past 10 years, but in particular in the, in the past five years, we're experiencing major skills shortages in the construction industry, um, along with an increase in subcontractors going into liquidation. In the last year, I think I've had about six subcontractors going into liquidation, which is very sad to hear in the industry. A lot of families affected by it. Um, when some of those subcontractors have a design responsibility, it makes it even more challenging. One of the major facade subcontractors went into liquidation there in December, and I think they were like 90% complete on one of the buildings that we were trying to certify across from Trinity College. Nobody wants to come in and finish out 10% of a subcontract package that they didn't design. So we had to figure out how to square that circle. And in that case, the builder had, um, had had specialist knowledge in the UK that they were able to bring back to Ireland and were able to leverage that specialist knowledge from a facade perspective. They also had to bring in another sub-consultant to actually stand over the remaining 10%. And uh, the building owner ultimately had to accept that the builder who was a major player in the building industry was going to be able to stand over all of the works. But um, I could see that that would cause a major challenge to maybe a builder that was a little bit lower down the food chain that didn't have the the specialist um, in-house knowledge, but uh, it gives you an idea of where we're going. m and &E subcontractors in particular are also finding it difficult. Um, I think the likes of the materials shortages, prices going up, it's squeezing the margins for the subcontractors. If they have builders who are, I suppose, being a little bit sharp with how they deal with them on the variation side of things, that can make it worse, but there's a bit of a domino effect then. We're even seeing some of the UK build teams on the builder side going into liquidation and then taking down their um, their Irish counterparts here in Ireland. So it's it's not a great it's not a, a great story at the moment, but it is something we need to be aware of because if that happens, how do you manage it through and how do you make sure it's um, it's deemed uh, certifiable, I suppose. And um, the activity has increased substantially, um, but in the recent years, offices are uh, on the decline, but houses are definitely on the increase. We have had an influx of uh, refugees who also need to be housed. So I think the numbers I heard most recently was in, in the region of 60 to 70,000 units needed per annum. We can't build that at the moment. So how are we gonna do it? We need to look at alternatives. Modern methods of construction have been promoted as being the panacea, but they, they're only a panacea if they can be built compliant. And um, I think we've had conversations with housing agencies and with major European <coughs> stakeholders in the MMC side of things, they're not really willing to come to Ireland unless they're getting thousands of units at a go. They're not coming for 300 or 200 units. So, and if they are coming, they wanna make sure that it's actually gonna be certifiable from their perspective, because they're probably not, in all honesty, used to working to the Irish building regulations. They need to understand what that means from their perspective. And we need to understand whether their uh, current certifications actually meets the Irish regulations or are they gonna to have to go out and do whole scale testing, which probably in some cases they will. Um, so um, we talked about material prices, shortages due to global factors, uh, Russia and Ukraine, is, the ongoing war is just making it much more difficult to get materials across, across the globe. Um, we're also seeing, I suppose, ESG, likes of environmental factors. When you get your materials closer to home, it might, you might pay more for it, but it might overall lead to a, a lower carbon footprint. That might not be in the building regulations, but it is in good sustainable building practices. So we're seeing that come in um, more often now. Um, so paperwork on its own, 
it's not sufficient. You can paper the walls with all the certs you want, but if you're not actually getting out and looking at the job, seeing the work as it's being done, and being satisfied that it is compliant, um, as an assigned certifier, I'd probably be on site every uh, once a fortnight or once a week, depending on what stage the project is at. So you're not there 100% of the time, but you need to set up a system that makes sure that the build team are actually capturing the evidence of compliance workmanship and putting it up onto a, I would say, a digital platform is, is required. So evidence of compliant workmanship on a digital platform. Um, yeah, we can have folders and folders of, of um, pre-pour check sheets, but we want to get the photographic evidence that it's actually is being done. The lap lengths are correct on the, on the pre-pours that um, the cavity barriers are going in where, they, where they're meant to go. Are they getting the butt joints tight? Are they taping them as the manufacturer requires it? And can they actually evidence it downstream or um, if it's been asked for and been um, interrogated, I suppose. And um, tracking the closeout um, of BCAR non-compliances is critical to building safety and overall project success. There isn't gonna be a project built that doesn't have something if, 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 if you have an assigned server saying, no, we've had no non-compliances on this project, it's all gone swimmingly, we, we're great. It's, they're a brilliant build team, we're really close. Yeah, that's not, I would say, that's inaccurate, okay? If they're not finding anything, they are, are not looking close enough. Um, I, I did have one builder say, oh, we've, we've had no, no non-compliances, and you go out and have a walk, and all of a sudden there's 25 non-compliances, so that's not... If there's something else happening there if, if that's the, the, the story you're being told, I suppose. Really what you need to be able to do is evidence that non-compliances will happen. Building teams will get savvier as, as they learn, particularly in the modern methods of construction. It needs to be very tightly watched. Um, but that's how we all learn. As long as they learn from, from the lessons and bring it on to the next project and don't remake the same mistakes, that's extremely frustrating for a an assigned certifier, I'd imagine it's also extremely uh, frustrating for a building control um, officer or fire safety sort of things. Like it's, it's um, very, uh, <laughs> you think you're getting nowhere when that's happening. So we try to communicate the lessons learned in CPDs like this, but also in sharing out um, a consolidated logs of lessons learned from recent projects with our uh, project stakeholders. So in Catalyst, everything we do is uh, about better quality and improving the cultures on sites. And we do this by working with the build teams and the design teams to, to, to actually understand where the regulation defects are occurring with the design team. So if it's not designed correct, it's never gonna be built correct. We need the design teams to understand what the current regulations are. The regulations are being updated on an ongoing basis. The design teams need to stay abreast of that. They can't expect that what they did 10 years ago if there's been a, a, a number of uh, building reg updates, they have to be kept up to, up to speed with that and design their buildings accordingly. You see part B is due out by the end of the year, which was what John gave us a little heads up on. Hopefully it's, uh, it's um, able to meet this particular date, but um, it'll be interesting now to see how that gets rolled out through the industry because there's gonna be some ripple effects um, on how buildings are built. So on the build team side, Builders don't go out to build a shoddy building, in my experience. They want to build it right, okay? It's very rare you get a builder that's actually deliberately trying to do it fast and cheap, at least not at the area of the food chain that we're operating in, which is mid to the high side. Um, but at the same time, they have to be willing to accept that there is lessons that they can learn. Um, coordination definitely is, if your coordination isn't good between your build team and your design team, and also your certification team, things are gonna go wrong. Um, benchmarking from my perspective is probably the single most important thing that I do as an assigned certifier is to make sure that the key benchmarks up front are done correct and right. Because at least, you know, if they've got the benchmark right, they can copy that out and um, make it for the rest of the project. The only problem with that that I see is that if you've got block one and you've benchmarked that, and it's all perfect. And then they got a new crew on block two. Block two, haven't seen the benchmarks in block one try to leave them available as, as, as open as possible and, and make sure that you can go back to them for the, for the new uh, team members that are joining the team. And if required, you re-benchmark if for some reason they're not getting the, the picture and the message. Uh, technical submittals, um, yeah, you need to have a robust technical submittal process that the design team is running the rule over all of the um, technical items that are being, uh, and materials that are being put forward 
are they meeting the regulations? Have they got the CE markings, the ETA, the various uh, fire test reports, et cetera? Um, risk rating. So not all building elements are, are, are rated equal. I think one of the earlier speakers spoke about how you carry out inspections on a risk-based approach along with random inspections. Not like pay attention to the areas that are most likely to have significant defects, um, but don't ignore the other areas. Uh, digitize inspections. So um, when we carry out inspections, much like the building control now, you drop a pin on your on your app, click sync as you go off the site. It's with the build team by the time you're driving back to the office. Um, so it certainly speeds up the turnaround and it should reduce the amount of rework that's happening. If you were dropping a pin on a fire door and they've got 50 more fire doors to do, if you're catching it there and not waiting a week to, to get the, the inspection out to them, they should be able to catch it for every other fire door that's coming on after it or, or whatever other element it is. And then the key metrics, so um, being able to look at the information, similar to the way uh, the building control earlier were showing that you could use the system to actually drill in and see where are the problem areas. Um, we're definitely seeing the ability to use that information to, to a positive advantage um, and, and focus the lens. Lack of consistency then, so differing interpretations by consultants, building control, build teams and certifiers, a lot of that comes down to communication, poor communication or improved communication. So what we found is that we need to actually have the conversations up front with the design team to understand how they are intending to meet compliance. And then we often need to meet if it's a more complicated build um, or strategy with the building control and make sure that we're aligned so that we're not going to get halfway down the project and then find that no, actually, we're not in agreement with you. You can't phase complete in the way that you've currently proposed because your basement car park has areas that are um, are not going to be handed over and that has key plants that is going to have to be maintained to allow the, the first phase to operate or whatever the, the, the item might be. Um, external factors, so yeah, Brexit definitely had an impact. Ukraine, Russia, material shortages, skill shortages, um, environmental perspectives, and then the liquidity of the build team. So we had gone through some of those already. Um, so Obi, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because uh, you're not going to be using it, but you probably will hear if you're talking to any of the Catalyst assigned certifiers that this is the system we use. We use it for quality management, design management. It also takes health and safety. And I think over COVID, we also brought in the COVID stuff into it too. Um, common data environment is a good idea to have all of the information in the one area that you can actually um, access BIM enabled and uh, queries and RFIs pretty much does, does all the things that you would need to do. And um, from my perspective, the mobile application is uh, critical. I, I couldn't do the job I do without having the system we have. I tried it back in 2013, 2014 on an Excel spreadsheet and, the, and Word. And, and it, we have, I think, we say we can't have more than five projects per assigned certifier, but we wouldn't be able to do five projects. And they're not all weighted equally. Obviously, you have to work out, is it a large semiconductor plant that might actually be just five projects in its own right, or is it is it a, a retail fit out that might be maybe a quarter of a project, but the general rule is that we say five projects per AC. Um, I know that from talking to fire engineers, their their metric is a little bit higher on that one. <laughs> they, they certainly, uh, they're, they're kept busy, but without having the digital platform in whichever area of the industry you work, if you're an assigned certifier, a design team member, a build team member, on the building control side of things, you need to have the information available and be able to utilize it in an efficient way. And that's what the digital platform does for you. Um, so the overview of uh, some of the key elements um, for the major roles. So we inspect based on competency and demonstrate due diligence. So a sign certifier isn't expected to know every single thing from part A to M. There's no one professional that I've come across that knows from parts A to parts M, back to front and front to back. They generally will have a reliance for some of the specialist areas on those um, on those particular uh, areas. So my my background would have been fixed firefighting, so um, sprinklers, dry risers, um, mechanical installations. I'm not a structural engineer. I don't claim to be a structural engineer. If I have a query on structure, I either ask somebody from my office to come out and look at it, or um, also get involved with the, the, the civil structural engineer on on the job to ask, are they satisfied that it meets part A, the building regulations? I can ask clever questions, having gone out and watched what they do, but I also need them to validate the answers then from a, a perspective of competency. Um, 
benchmark we talked about being absolutely key to delivering compliant buildings. Um, clear records of inspection with photographic evidence. So check sheets aren't going to cut it anymore. If somebody's just giving you a check sheet from a build side for their pre-pour, it's not showing you the lap lengths. It's not showing you whether they've got adequate spacer bars. It's not giving you the information that you can see that the cavity barrier is where it needs to be. Is it all in one line? Have they got the butt joints with no gaps, the tape and the joint and et cetera? The build teams need to step up to the mark as well. They need to, they're the ones that are there 100% of the time. If they're not taking photographic evidence, we don't have photographic evidence for that building. And if something happens downstream, you're not gonna be able to rely on it. I've been asked for, for records in a building that we signed off in 2015 Without photographic evidence, you're not actually able to prove that what you did and signed off before they had three more fit outs in between was actually compliant. So you need to have that information available. Um, inspections triggered by notification protocols. Um, so we have a notification with the build team. Generally, we don't rely on Obi to do that. I rely on Outlook because everyone uses Outlook to manage their calendars these days. And we haven't quite worked out how to manage that in Obi. But Aside from that, um, we also need to carry out unscheduled inspections because if the builder thinks you're turning up every Thursday, they're going to be expecting you every Thursday or every second Thursday. Um, I suppose you need to be turning up on a Tuesday or Monday or some other day of the week at some stage to, to make sure you're getting the full picture. Um, also, be in consultation with the members of the design team and plan to oversee and implement the inspection plan during the construction. Make sure that your design team are actually turning up on a reasonable inspection uh, frequency and um, the system will flag up if they don't, which is a good thing. Um, and generally the building owner gets sight of the report that comes out. So it's fairly obvious who's been doing their inspections and who hasn't. Um, maintain records, ensure evidence-based closeout of all non-compliances. So we need photographs to close out the, uh, the issues. We don't wanna find out in six months time that, oh, we said it was all done, it was all, it was all kosher. Where's the photograph to demonstrate that you've actually um, corrected it? And, the design team have to review that closeout as well, along with the assigned certifier, so everyone's satisfied that it will ultimately be certifiable downstream. Um, the A's with local authorities throughout the project, that's key to success. Um, at least that's what I found anyway, is that if you're having the conversations, and not all projects will get inspected by the local authority, but I found probably on the projects we're involved in, more often than not, we are seeing the local authority on our sites. Um, coordinate the closeout of any Section 11 clarification requests, like, that can be as simple as an email sometimes, or sometimes it requires a, a detailed section 11 closeout with the design team and the build team involved. Um, and also no longer acceptable in many jurisdictions to have a director with limited site involvement to certify as the AC. I think that's probably reasonable because how can a director say that they've actually seen the works if they haven't been on site um, validating that? So, and um, build team inspections, so, Builders need to cooperate with the design certifier and the design team and the other certifiers. Uh, if you've got a non-cooperative builder, you need to have a conversation with your build building owner and explain how this is not going to work out so well if they can't. Um, but for the most part, I've found build teams are generally looking to cooperate. They're looking to understand and to do things better. Um, ensure that workmanship complies with the requirements of the building regulations. Um, so that's the builder's responsibility. And I know that there's sometimes a difference of opinion on this in terms of part D, but ultimately the builder is a party that's building the works. They need to be putting the works in, in a workman-like fashion and a work person-like fashion. Um, so, and they need to be able to demonstrate that they're meeting part D. If they're putting in, like we sometimes bring out um, ex, ex uh, block workers to have a look at masonry works. And if they're not satisfied with it, the wall comes down. That's what we're doing, but it doesn't happen all the time. Um, generally, they get better very quickly if you make them take the first wall down, though. Um, that's what we found. Um, ensure that materials which are selected and that they are responsible for comply with the requirements of the building regulations. That's their responsibility to be putting it forward. Yes, the design team review it and the design certifier review it, but it's the builder's responsibility to make sure that it is compliant in the first instance. The design team may have um, educated questions on it and, and look for evidence and demonstration of it. Um, modern methods of construction and innovative materials for Part D compliance, it's certainly providing a challenge for us. And I think we could have a whole, a whole CPD day on that. So I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole, but I will say that 
if they get it wrong on modern methods of construction, it starts rolling out across. Uh, it's hard to, un to wind back the clock if you've got 50 units that have arrived on site and they're all wrong. You actually need to go to the factory. You need to get on a plane in some cases. We had ones that were being proposed to come from China. Eventually, they just they came to the conclusion that they couldn't satisfy themselves that it was going to meet the Irish building regulations and they pulled back from that. That's not to say it won't get there, but I think there's still a ways to go. Um, the ones we're looking at more closely now are, are Central Europe-based large-scale factories and also the Irish um, MMC plants, but they don't really have the capacity to deliver the units that we need. So we need to, we need to try and solve the conundrum, but it's going to take a um, collaborative approach, but also probably will require some full-scale testing, and um, that takes time because you can't get slots in the, in the uh, test houses that easily. And some of the test houses aren't actually large enough to facilitate the burn test that will be required. Um, provide the assigned certifier with such documents which they are responsible for. We do that through critical documents on our OB platform. So in the most recent one we've done, I think I have 440 critical documents called up by the various design team members split across the various disciplines. They come in, they're reviewed by the civil structural engineer, the m &E consultant, the architect, a DAC consultant, whether they're there, a fire engineer, where, where they're appointed on the project, um, and also the assigned certifier to make sure that they're satisfied that the documentation is correct. So although you can't, you can't rely only on the certificates, you still do need the certificates, and it needs to be there and available um, to be able to certify the works. Ensure the coordination and provision of all test certificates and confirmations are provided, um, and maintain records of compliant workmanship provide close out evidence for any non-compliances. So yeah, it's the build team members that are, are tasked with going and, and, and validating, our, 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 sorry, on capturing the close out information and then the design team and the assigned certifier validate that they're satisfied. And any section 11 uh, close out information also needs to be fed in from the build side um, to the AC or, or building control as may be required. Um, signatory is a director of the building company for the build team side of things and we do know that some commencement notices have been invalidated because the director was on it when they went and looked up the CRO wasn't actually on the on the register and had to be resubmitted it cost them maybe a week or a week and a half in in their start date so they have to be aware that that's that's who should be signing the, the certs and um, code of practice then so some of some of the feedback we've had from I suppose complex commencement notices, um, at least in a Dublin area, um, bulk dig and footings equals a commencement notice with documentation uh, due to part C1 and C3 that, uh, being triggered. Um, an exception to this rule that we found was that uh, where there was an enabling works planning was in place and the contig and secan piling works to facilitate the enabling works didn't form part of the permanent works to a building. That's probably, as I said, an exception, but the rule is generally, at least in Dublin area that the bulk dig or, or um, the footings, digging out for the footings is a commencement notice with documentation. Um, demolition site clearance equals no commencement notice required. However, an email to council to keep them informed is generally what we do. We make sure that they know what's happening. It also means that if, uh, if a neighbour that's interested happens to put in a call that the building controller already informed that works has started. Um, so new floors uh, require a new commencement notice with documentations and separate completions. Um, you don't want to get that one wrong because if you put a floor on top of a building and haven't got your commencement notice, you're not able to walk back that. There's no provision in the regs to be able to retrospectively submit a commencement notice for works that you've started, which could mean that you're knocking down um, a portion of works that might be built perfectly well, but um, doesn't have the administrative requirements of the building control amendment regulations. Common basements require careful consideration in relation to uh, M&E systems, both the commencement and completion stages, particularly where phase completions are proposed. Um, the wording of the commencement notices need to be considered carefully. We found this one is coming up more often now, as some building controls insist that the wording of the commencement notice matches the fire cert exactly along with the implication for CCCs, particular for 7 notice applications. Um, so, at the completion stage, with more complex buildings, I have I have one building where we were at Rev 19 of a BCAR commencement and completion strategy before we even commenced. So that is definitely off the deep end as far as as far as uh, interactions with building control and the, the landlord and the tenant stakeholders as it was. 
and probably shows some of the level of sophistication that some of the clients are bringing to the table. Um, but either way, you should have a clear strategy mapped out and agreed and aligned with the building control. Early stage engagement, engagement to local councils, key to success. Um, boundary drawings at completion stage to explicitly demark the areas that are covered by each completion. Consider how the works that are commenced will be certified and completion and choose completion wording carefully as well. Make sure that you're clear on what is being certified. Ensure that the BCAR strategy is communicated to the local council, in particular fire alarm and emergency lighting, uh, with explicit detailing of provisions uh, set on the floor plates for landlord shell core office fit outs. Yeah, we've definitely seen that the requirement for revised fire cert over revised fire cert over revised fire cert has been coming in. And from talking to some of the, the, the people out in the lobby there, it's probably putting a strain on the on the people that are having to approve the fire certs at the moment. Um, but that is the way things are currently required to be done, at least in a Dublin um, basis. So uh, I can't speak too much to the rest of the, the country on that, but that's the way we're having to do it. Recent completion strategy direction from building control, unless there's a party on the fit outside to take up the bat and building control may invalidate the completion submission. That's very difficult though, where one of your, or your tenant might be bought out and then it goes into a whole rerunning of the tender process that could throw you out by six months. Does that mean that the landlord team has to wait for six months? Possibly it does, but I would say that's maybe not the most reasonable way to approach it. Um, it's not in keeping with how buildings are getting built. So it requires continued dialogue with the building control by the ACs. Unfortunately, this code of practice has been described by the powers that be as a ladybird book when it comes to dealing with a semiconductor factory or some of the more complex uh, buildings that we're coming across, particularly with phasing strategies on multi-building multi, uh, sites. Um, additional fire alarm detectors requested at late stage by building control due to fire curtains and the facade is an example where you might have to go in and revise your, your works to meet the requirements if you haven't had that conversation and been bringing the building control along the journey, I suppose. Um, in background of recent building control inspections, so we've seen increase in number of building control uh, engineers in various councils, not across all councils, but certainly in some councils. We've seen, I suppose, newspaper articles about um, the performance of building control has certainly focused the mind, I would say, the 12 to 15% targets and being met. So we are definitely seeing more, more boots on the ground from a building control perspective, which is, I welcome that. And um, building control, recent exposure to buildings that were put onto the register and subsequently not found to be fully complete. Um, also has um, looked for building control to de-risk themselves from further exposure to this. And they're getting a lot more active as our experience, which uh, is welcome from my perspective. Uh, this presents a challenge that um, where there's a difference of opinion about what is and isn't compliant with the building regs. Can you certify a landlord shell and core project, even though you might not have um, any fit out works on the floor plate? And can you agree that it's being certified to allow a fit out to commence as opposed to certified for occupancy? Um, temporary arrangements need to be captured in the fire certain DAC reports and may require further revisions of the FSCs and DACs as we discussed. Um, post commencement significant design changes in the notified works need to be um, need to be I suppose communicated to the building control as per 5.3 um, in the code of practice so should be certified and submitted before the relevant works commence um, so if you've changed the structure of your building post commencement you need to let the building control know um, if it's off site or on site if that's changed as well that's one of the tick boxes on the on the building control system uh, revised fire safety certificates, if required, must be granted before the works that are related to the revised fire cert take place, notwithstanding 7 a notice option. Generally, um, issue the current FSC and DAX to the building control inspector prior to inspections. That just means that they're working off the current information because, as I said, we've had projects with seven or eight fire certs on them, so it can be a little bit confusing if you're the building control officer, which is the most up-to-date uh, version of the information. Um, the increase in rate of the subcontractors, we talked about that. It's certainly causing challenges and we're going to have to manage that as the dominoes continue to fall, unfortunately. Um, something has gone on there, but okay. Structural items then uh, arising at construction stage, honeycombing, adequate cover to rebar, pockets, um, methodology for closeout and agreeing it with the CNS engineer, making sure that there's no items of a, a significant structural defect uh, occurring on the project. 
cleaning of concrete joints before follow-on pours is something that we've seen with um, the likes of slip form. Uh, I suppose it's a method of construction that you need to be aware of, that it, it needs close attention on the on the, the cleaning out of the joints prior to follow-on. Uh, structural steel on-site adjustments and impacts to inch and and paint. So um, if it is being adjusted on-site, it needs to be needs to be reviewed by, we generally insist on a, an inch mess and paint third party inspector, but not all projects have that. But the specialists should definitely be involved, making sure the DFTs are correct to the manufacturer's instructions and uh, that the substrate is, is the correct, uh, it's been brought back to the correct substrate before they apply the paint. And um, planning submissions as part of the BCMS uploads and uh, not acceptable where they differ from the construction issue drawings. Um, water damage, construction, mole growth, uh, need robust temporary weathering measures to be in place to avoid trap moisture. We certainly saw it over COVID where sites were down for periods of time up to up to four months of, of, of no activity. Um, you need to go back in now and make sure that all the moisture, first of all, ideally you've put in the, the weathering conditions that will, will, will protect it, but if they haven't, how are you gonna validate now that there's no trap moisture or mole growth occurring in your building? Um, here's some an example of a complex BCAR strategy, phase one in the, uh, in the pinky color um, with a CCC with the landlord and phase two uh, in the green with a CCC with the landlord. And then you have the incoming floor plate being certified by the tenant. This required strategy be, to be agreed with the, the building control and ultimately uh, make sure all parties are satisfied um, with the way it's gonna be certified. So on part A structure, precast manufacturers we've seen, and you would think that precast should be without issue because it's factory made. So it does allow for, I suppose, uh, a repeatability, but we have found loop toys missing in precast, some other issues uh, from precast perspective. So it needs to be, needs to be reviewed by the civil structural engineer and the precast specialist designer needs to come out to site, not just the installation uh, crew that they've subcontracted in. Um, specialist piling systems, SFS walls. Uh, we had a piling, uh, piling foundations that were going in, and when you counted the bars on it, it had six. And when you looked at the drawings, it said it needed eight bars. On the, uh, when we queried it and it stood them down, they went away and did a calc and found that six was actually okay, which was unusual, I would say. But it also meant that the, the I think the, the piling specialist installer then had a word with the piling specialist designer to ask why are we over engineering it to have two extra on every pile. But ultimately they should have been checking that before it went into the ground. It shouldn't have been an assigned certifier picking that up. Um, alignment of precast or in situ stairs, parquet tolerances to be surveyed and validated. Again, you would think that precast should be coming from the factory all perfect and right. But if the mold is wrong, then all of the stairs are wrong as well. And that's gonna be difficult to rep. Uh, retrospectively correct. Um, reinforcing steel, incorrect gauges, lap lengths, even missing bars. Um, you need pre-pour inspections with, with the CNS engineer attending, making sure that you're actually getting the validation that, that what is on the design is being achieved. Um, concrete cube, cube strength not reaching design strength. It's uncommon to see that, but if it ever happens on a project, it's a nightmare. It's very, very difficult to actually repair and certify. You're talking about jetting out joints and trying to, it's, extremely difficult so not one that you ever want to have to go down and you you want to be flagging it early if it is coming up uh, if it ever comes up on a, a project in terms of the strengths of the of the the concrete secondary steel then potential design responsibility gap you see the structural engineers kind of step back from it because it's not really not really our responsibility the architects don't lean into it because they're not structural engineers it requires a specialist to take responsibility and have it clearly mapped out in the design responsibility matrix and take responsibility for that. Uh, fire rating considerations from structural perspective, particularly for MMC. So that that Chinese project that I mentioned, they hadn't had it um, assessed for a fire from the outside coming in, um, which meant that their structural steel was not protected on the outside of their building. And we pointed out that was not gonna be acceptable from a building regs perspective and in an Irish context. I don't know how they were managing it over in China, but however, um, they had to, they had to move away from that one. Block work and brickwork, uh, the consistency of workmanship, wall ties, joint tolerances, all need to be checked and correct. Um, part B, so I know that we have fire engineering um, 
presentation from Declan later on, so I'm not going to spend too long on, on this one, but I, I do also know that it's probably, from a, a risk perspective, it's the one with the highest risk. You don't generally hear of buildings falling down, but you do hear of buildings burning down. So um, phase completions, challenging, where strict compliance with the building regulations is not possible. Um, and that's for at that phase in time. So revised fire cert re requirements to capture the transitional arrangements, as we discussed, uh, fire doors and ironmongery, like, it is amazing after 10 years that fire doors are still not necessarily going in right, but it is still happening. I will say that part B and part M uh, seem to clash a little bit in terms of your 30 Newton opening force, also your smoke extract systems when you turn them on. So the way the smoke extract systems work is that under the normal course of events, part M requires 30 Newtons, but technically when part B kicks in, in a, in a fire condition, smoke extract system code allows that to go up to 100 Newtons. But where does that leave somebody that's disabled to get into the refuge? That leaves them in limbo land. So we still look for them to get that, that uh, door opening force down to the 30 Newtons and to engineer it in um, and carry a CFD analysis. We've actually seen some mock-up units being built in some of the, uh, the units, but we've also seen they've introduced a lag on the smoke extract system to allow the doors to close in sequence and I think that's probably been the one that's been most successful for us. Um, travel through an uncertified area to reach a certified area is, is a challenge that needs to be thought through. If you are going to do it, you need to have buy-in of your building control to say that that is um, going to be acceptable. For the most part, it's not. So we try to avoid it. And um, BCAR strategies for common plant areas often not included in the certification of the initial phases. So if you have plant on the roof of building two, and a fees building one, and you're handing over building one first, how are you actually gonna certify those works? What is the strategy to make that happen? Um, sprinkler valves, the 2017 volume B, residential requires isolation valve at each unit as opposed to on the level. Um, you definitely don't wanna be finding that out on a Friday when you have 300 students coming in on a Saturday. Um, we had one project where that happened and they managed to get all of the valves installed Friday night, which is, a commendable amount of work but uh, also a massive risk on causing a leak in that building they managed to do it but none of the team ever want to repeat that that pressure um fire dampers then and i suppose just back on that one it was a condition in the fire cert it got missed it shouldn't have got missed it should have been done um it should have been picked up by the team and also by the science error but i would say the fire engineer in that case uh, was the one who building control honed in on and it was a, an uncomfortable conversation, I would say. But either way, they, they pulled through and managed to get it all done. Uh, fire dampers then, the type and the check, type check as early as possible um, to make sure that they, um, at earliest practical stage, including location check, yeah. So are dampers, as per the fire cert, have they been installed? Do they have the correct uh, dimensions for around the OPE between fire dampers? Are they actually maintainable? Oftentimes, the access hatches that the, the architects um, approve are not the access hatches that the m and &E subcontractor needs to actually get in and maintain them. So we need to actually sanity check that, show me that you can actually ma maintain this damper. And it's not the man with the, the two meter long arm that needs to actually do the, do the check. Um, sprinkler valves we talked about there, yeah. Additional emergency lighting on roof terraces and plant areas. We see that coming up with building control on a regular enough basis. We're trying to advise the ME consultants that this keeps happening, so don't under, uh, be better to over, uh, undersell and over deliver rather than the other way around, which, but I think they're getting the message now. Um, exit signage, is it unambiguous? I think Mark had a, a picture up of the, the emergency lighting signs pointing you in opposite directions um, or blank if they're going in uh, double sided. Fire ducts, fire rate, glazing, fire curtains, integrity only insulation. Uh, and integrity or radiation control. So there's three different types. What does the fire cert say and have they actually matched that? If they haven't matched it, it's gonna be very difficult to get it in the last month of the project because usually they've gone for the lower bar and they have to get the higher bar, which usually takes six to eight weeks to get manufactured. Um, dry risers, labeling of inlets to avoid ambiguity, particularly where there's multiple dry riser feeds. Uh, heritage buildings, I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole, but. Suffice to say that heritage buildings provide particular challenges, particularly from a Part B perspective. Um, fire alarms, are the audibility checks correct? Have they taken off the little covers that, that they leave on? Have they gone around and done a full check on that? Um, compartment walls, 
are they sterile and no socket boxes in them? Um, fire search and DAX for alternative proposals to be approved, uh, for example, open plan versus cellularized offices to allow flexibility of how the building is actually going to get built because they might go and get a tenant and then all of a sudden you have to scramble. Part C issues. So radon, we have a new radon map out uh, last year, updated charts with 5%, 10%, 20% chance of radon with the 20% chance being the red. Um, careful consideration is required by the team to select the correct barrier. Um, white tank system seems to be coming into, into vogue, I suppose, definitely in a Dublin perspective and probably around the country as well. The reason for that is because that the build team reckon that they don't require a membrane, the traditional membrane, if they use a white tank system, but need to make sure the certification is there. Has it been CE marked? Is it, is it going to actually provide the adequate um, protection? The only thing I will say about the white tank system is the way the salespeople say it from a waterproofing perspective is we'll guarantee that no water will get into the building. And if it does, we'll come back and inject it. But that kind of leaves me with a little bit of an ambiguity there because if we'll come back and inject it, what happens if there's just air there and it's a low water table? Now, I have gone to a specialist in the UK on uh, white tank systems and look for their position on it. And they're, they're satisfied that it does meet the requirements to, to be below the, the Becquerel uh, levels. We also retrospectively test and make sure that it is doing what it says it's doing. Um, we also have egg crate drainage systems and wet areas with screeds and venting considerations. Um, I'd say probably the traditional membrane systems are not so happy with it, the, the manufacturers where they're seeing the white tank systems are being proposed. Hazardous materials on sites um, like tanneries, it's a specialist area. Any ones that I've been involved in, we've got a specialist involved and uh, I, I'm not qualified to, uh, to make the call on hazardous materials on existing sites. That is a specialist area. Um, and then the updated radon map is available on the EPA website. This is one that came up on a school in terms of Part K. Um, our assigned certifier said they wouldn't certify the works because they felt it was unsafe where there was a, a mid-rail in a primary school at 600 high on the landing. So what they ended up doing is they, the, the uh, department revised their requirement to have a two meter high on the landing if they were leaving this, the 600 hand, mid handrail. I think to certify it at the time, they actually chopped off the lower one on the, on the landing, but it's something to be aware of on, on school projects. Um, I have a seven year old son and I can certainly see him seeing it as a climbing frame. So I think we have to be aware that primary school children don't see risk the same way as even a secondary school student or a, an adult. Um, so part L issues and um, the insulation choice we're seeing um, some of the developers basically take out a company policy not to use um, flammable materials. They're, they're going towards the rock wool side of things. Um, that's more from an insurance perspective is, is, is what we've been indicated. Um, I know that if we go for our PI insurance, we get asked how many buildings have we done with PIR, PUR, all the various other um, acronyms, but it, it's starting to affect insurance for design teams. It's starting to ins affect insurance for build owners. So it is certainly, while it's a part L consideration for the thickness to get your U value requirements, um, it's also a consideration from a fire perspective. Uh, blinds, are they required for the part L strategy? Technically they are. If they're, if they're in, if they're included in the part L strategy, they need to be in, installed or some level of blinding needs to be agreed or a phased completion where you come back and do a, a separate phase for the blinds if it's agreeable to the building control. Air tightness membranes, ultimately validated with an air tightness test, but they need to be checked as they're going in and, and not have holes happening uh, throughout the building. Um, thermal bridges aren't always well mitigated and probably not that well understand by, understood by teams on the build side and, and sometimes need to be just um, explained. Um, over, overheating considerations in building design, particularly given recent heat wave trends with the uh, climate change. So it's certainly, I, I believe, that's going to come up now very, um, very clear soon enough where I think residents are starting to push back on this where I think architecturally they lean in, more glazing is good from an architectural perspective for a visual aesthetic, but you need to put in the me measures there to make sure that your building doesn't overheat, make sure it's comfortable. 
um, in the various climates we're going to experience into the future. Part, part M issues, so raised access floor, uh, focus, on, on the DAC, uh, focus on DAC strategy for landlord and tenants. So if you're not going to put in the raised access floor, has the DAC explicitly called out what level of finish will be put in there? Um, revised DACs required to show the phasing. We've basically said assume raised access floor to our, um, to our landlords unless they want to build it in. But uh, so for the landlord delivery into the future or ensure that the DAC is granted stipulating transitional arrangements for compliance. Access around the building, it's certainly one that is improving, but um, it still has a ways to go, I think, to make it more accessible for everyone. The distance between the handrails externally um, and where you need to have extra handrails. Imposed tactile wayfinding signage, outboard rocker switches in core areas. Um, it's certainly coming up in Dublin anyway, that one. Uh, level access onto balconies. I've seen DAC consultants have called that both ways, but from my perspective, you need level access onto a balcony. Like, how can you turn around and say, well, okay, so you're in a wheelchair, you can't go onto your balcony. That's not acceptable. I don't think so anyway. Um, and we push back on that one. But design teams don't always agree because it means extra height on your building. So if, if it's not uh, built in early, it can be challenging from a planning perspective. Accessible bathrooms, dimension checks, you would expect after 10 years that they could actually install a bathroom to all the dimensions. But anyone that's gone out and done a part M check will have come across all sorts of different, um, they're getting better, but very slowly. Um, yeah, so uh, plugs and uh, overflows in the, in, in the sinks is one that's also coming up. Um, in Dublin anyway. Tea stations and reception desks, I think Mark mentioned that for the recesses for the wheelchair users. Um, and we talked about the RIF floors in the GA section. So in this case, they had to go in and get it built in as part of the development strategies proposed to fit out floors, including the insulation and raise access floors that will be completed as part of the post completion phase by the incoming tenants. So they've explicitly called that out. Um, here's our outboard rockers. Uh, Query on the 300 mil leading edge requirement within apartments. I, I tend to go and, 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 and uh, allow for it. Um, definitely in common areas and for part-time student apartments, a point of interpretation for standard apartments, buildings for everyone would encourage it for all apartments, I think is what we came to the conclusion there. Um, signage then, location of signage clearly marking above the disabled refuge call points to make sure that they know where they are so that when they make the call through to the reception desk that they can explain the location. I know it'll come up on the other side, but it gives the person a, piece, a bit more peace of mind to know that they can communicate clearly with the, uh, with the person at the reception. Impose tactile signage uh, when at a height that they can be touched, uh, as in the signage. It's, I suppose that one is open to interpretation because they can just locate it higher, I suppose, is what we've seen. But that's maybe not in the keeping of it. People, I, I would say teams are getting better. And uh, developer clients that we have are, are starting to, to lean into a little bit more. Um, signage at accessible car parking bays, also on the wall as well as on the floor. Um, so general issues, incomplete works to the back of the house and common basement areas. Yeah, so the, the works need to be complete. Um, basements that appear to be still a construction site if it looks like a construction site and it has a load of materials stored in it, then for the most part, building controller are going to call it out and say that's not going to be acceptable. And from a design certified perspective, it's also not acceptable. It's a, flamm a flammable load in a, in a basement that's not been allowed for. Uh, lack of adherence to management strategy for common basements. If you've agreed a strategy, you need to follow through on it as the build team. Um, incomplete uh, adjacent building interfaces. So if you're interfacing with another building, you make sure that that your building is safe and that you're not going to cause a risk to another building that's adjacent. Um, external escapes uh, to be managed on escape routes. Um, so certificate compliance on completion, is it substantially complete? Is it practically complete? What do all of these different terms mean? They mean different things to different people and it needs to be clear to, to the team what is meant. From a building control perspective, I don't agree with linking um, validation onto the register with practical completion. But I still know that the legal legals are still continuing to do that, which causes challenges for the industry. Um, building control, expect the works to be fully complete, 100%. No snags, I think that's somewhat unrealistic, but no, like this here is obviously not complete. Um, so project team to allow for adequate time for building control final inspections as well to mitigate issues arising immediately. 
prior or even worse after occupation slash validation date. Um, this one here I've, I've included because it's causing an issue on the assigned certifier uh, certification side of things. So the CIF brought out a practice note, not with consultation with the rest of the, the four stakeholder groups. And essentially that that has reinforced to say that where there's designed by a, a subcontractor that's carrying out the works, it's a CS, CF01 or a CSS, CF02, that's the appropriate cert. That is pretty much what the practice note uh, three says. But the issue is that the design teams have been looking for these ones for the last 10 years. And now there's a bit of a, a tug of war between the design teams asking for certs and build teams being willing to provide the certs. When we've asked the legal teams whether one provides better protection than the other, they said they're, they're, they're pretty much equal from that perspective, but design teams are less convinced. What we would suggest is that all of the certs that are required are explicitly mapped out in a design responsibility matrix included in the contract so that the build team knows that they can allow for them. At least that way downstream, you're not having a, a tug of war on what's uh, the correct certs um, and the assigned certifier being the referee. So the keys to success, um, you need to resource the project appropriately, in particular the competent person responsible for BCAR on the build side of the teams. We've seen that if there's a, a BCAR engineer with the builder, generally those projects work better because they're taking it seriously. If it's the project manager and on the side he's doing BCAR, and I know there's different projects and different scales and all that good stuff, but that's generally not a recipe for success. And um, discuss the construction program with, uh, I still got caught out there, Catalyst, <laughs> IGBT, and define the appropriate inspection regime to keep BCAR on the agenda throughout. So it needs to be coming up in the, on the two weekly meetings, and it needs to be a separate BCAR meeting as well to discuss key issues from a BCAR perspective. I talk about benchmark, right first time construction. That's how you achieve it. If you make sure it's right at the beginning, everyone's agreeing, then you can uh, repeat it. All parties to engage in the BCAR process to upload evidence of compliant workmanship and close outs where required. Um, the AC to proactively manage the building control interface to ensure that there is an alignment of the BCAR strategy and in particular raise awareness of lessons learned on project. There's nothing worse than making the same mistake twice. So make it once, learn the lesson and make sure everyone in your teams and your wider teams. So we, we try to send it out to the industry for the various design teams that we work in the build teams that they would also be aware of them. And thank you for your time, folks. Thanks, Colin.